we'll try this audio um, this isn't as good as the desktop mic but uh, it will probably work just fine for now and uh, is this the first go anyway so um, welcome to West Pennsylvania Mushroom Club and uh, yeah I think we've got confirmation we've got audio now and there's a chat box so people can uh, put in uh, questions there and hopefully I'll see them and uh, we'll be able to do you know answer the questions so um, yeah this is the brave new world of uh, video meetings I guess um, this is our club's first attempt at doing this and it's something that we wanted to do um, to actually reach our membership um, at the uh, main meeting so uh, Beachwood Farms we wanted to or what I wanted to do was to be able to broadcast from there so people up in Erie and uh, more outflung areas can actually tune in and watch so anyway yeah for those that don't know uh, my name is Richard Jacob and um, this is going to be this month's uh, May month's meeting uh, normally this would be the cultivation night uh, but obviously with the ongoing pandemic uh, we can't really uh, do a larger gathering um, for cultivation night normally we get about a hundred people there and we knew we were going to have issues uh, once the situation was announced and so we didn't even order the spawn um, but instead I've got a, a talk for you on uh, heavy metals in mushrooms um, but before that just got a couple of slides um, um, let's see All right, so uh, first is a little bit of news. We've got the May June newsletter is up on the website. You should have received an email uh, with it, and um, got all the sort of update news in the club. I can say or announce now um, the board approves the honorary membership nomination for Barbara De Rizzo, our former treasurer, uh, to become a lifelong member, and this. Um, approval has or the the vote has been carried out by the membership and it's been passed and ratified so congratulations Barbara you're now a lifelong member of the club you can never leave so not only have you put all of that service in there you're going to be a member forever um, so congratulations um, on the matter of membership um, Jim uh, was it gave me a uh, update on number of members at the moment we're about 746 uh, so that's not quite as many as last year um, at the end of last year we had just over a thousand um, but I think it's pretty respectable uh, particularly as we haven't had any actual meetings and normally we pick up a lot of uh, renewals at the meetings and uh, so that's about 415 um, households okay so um, going on from membership uh, we're going to go uh, into the talk now uh, heavy metal contamination in edible mushrooms so um, I noticed that uh, there was quite a lot of literature on uh, heavy metal analysis in mushrooms and uh, we know that mushrooms absorb um, and bioaccumulate metals uh, in the fruiting bodies and this is one of the reasons why they're used for micro remediation is you know because they do pick up metals from the environment from the, the growing conditions and so uh, as we have quite a big history in Pittsburgh um, from you know metal smelting and, and all the metal works there is a chance that we've got contamination in certain areas around uh, um, around here and even going up to Erie there were um, you know metal works and industrial sites up there as well so I thought it would be interesting to be able to um, take some mushrooms and analyze them and see uh, how much uh, metal is in them um, and I spoke to one of our neighbors who works at Eurofin and um, she very kindly offered to run some test samples for the club and uh, so we uh, had those done for free and 
then what we hope to do is um, take uh, uh, some more samples this year and uh, do a wider base study. But these are the results just from four initial samples, two different species. And um, also just reading around on the web, I know that a couple of other clubs and amateurs have uh, reported testing mushrooms for metals, particularly arsenic in morales. Um, so people used to use arsenic pesticide on apple trees in apple orchards and uh, particularly older apple orchards when that was still legal. And uh, mushroom hunters are worried that when they pick morales from these old apple orchards, uh, that they might be contaminated with arsenic and as far as i know the tests that were being run didn't show any contamination so although the arsenic may have been sprayed and may have been absorbed into the ground the mushrooms didn't seem to be concentrating it and you know as a, a sort of result of this um, if we do find any particularly contaminated parks or areas uh, we can advise club members you know don't pick mushrooms from that area and if we find any particular species that uh, bioaccumulate uh, mushrooms in significant amounts, again, we can advise club members and say, you know, it's, we know it's an edible mushroom, but in the Pittsburgh region, um, you shouldn't, or, or within the West Pennsylvania region, you shouldn't uh, pick and eat that mushroom. And uh, so here's an old picture from 1907, um, just showing you the um, homestead works and Pittsburgh had about 250 steel mills and blast furnaces in the region. So there really was a huge amount of um, metal works in the area. And these sort of smelters um, can release pollution and the metal can be sort of deposited within a five mile or greater region from the smelter. And we don't really know how far the contamination could go, um, but also there can be contamination from mining and other sources. So when I talk about heavy metals, what am I referring to? Is it bands? Well, I'm a fan of music and there are a bunch of uh, British heavy metal bands that came out in the early 80s, but that's not really what I'm referring to. So in this case, we're talking about metals that um, may be, uh, or which are uh, considered high density, um, literally heavy metals. And, um, and those elements, they were normally in the transition metal section of the periodic table, uh, particularly arsenic, lead, cadmium, mercury, chromium, uh, but also there's copper, zinc, nickel, selenium, and so on. And if we look at the um, periodic table, we can see the uh, potentially toxic elements marked in red. And um, the advice which I discovered um, in the last few days while reading up on this subject is that we shouldn't really call them heavy metal. Uh, toxicity anymore it's really potentially toxic elements uh, not all of these elements um, are, are well as they are they're all metal but some of them are um, uh, more unusual metals um, and they're not all sort of considered heavy metals but um, it's these particularly elements um, that we should now call potentially toxic elements um, I'm going to start referring to them as that in the talk. Of course, I'd released the title as heavy metal uh, contamination in mushrooms, and I, I didn't really want to change that at this point. So what do these potentially toxic elements do? Um, some of them are actually essential as micronutrients. So this means uh, that without this metal in your diet, uh, your body will, uh, will be deficient, and there can be diseases and syndromes which relate to those deficiencies. So these metals at low trace amounts are actually important and not toxic at all. Uh, but if you ingest too much of these metals, uh, particularly ingest over time, uh, they can cause issues such as gastrointestinal or nervous system problems. Uh, um, and they, they basically mimic some of the other metals which are used by the body and they can interrupt enzymes and how they work. They can interact with DNA in such ways that they, they cause basic cellular processes to shut down and they can also um, cause uh, cancer. So they can be a, a trigger um, or one of many triggers for a, a cancer event. 
So it's definitely something that you want to avoid if you can. Um, lead obviously uh, is quite well known uh, through lead paint, uh, linked to bone, heart and behavioral disorders. And this is something that we worry about in small children because the amount of lead that they ingest to their size uh, can cause issues. Um, and lead is of course in, in the environment here. Um, mercury uh, can cause brain, kidney damage and loss of cognition. So again, want to avoid that. Um, arsenic, well-known carcinogen, and cadmium leads to heart disease, skin and kidney disorders. So all metals that we want to avoid um, excess amounts. And uh, one question is, are there safe limits of these metals? And uh, most levels are reported in milligrams per kilogram and um, of dried mass or wet mass. And those are the values that we're going to use throughout this talk. Uh, most science is done in uh, the metric system and not the imperial system. So everything's milligrams, grams, kilograms, and so on. And the FDA has not actually established uh, legal limits, regulatory limits for most of these heavy metals. Um, in there's a couple of limits for some finished food products. Um, there are limits for bottled water. So, for example, uh, arsenic in juice and lead in hard candy. So arsenic, particularly in apple juice, I think, and lead in hard candy was uh, 0.5 milligrams a kilogram. And that comes from um, a period of time where a lot of candy was made in Mexico. And I think they used a, um, a med a lead alloy in the um, presses for the sweets. And so a little bit of this lead was coming away with each batch of sweets they made each batch of candy and there was some contamination. Um, I think it helped the sugar release from the, the mold. Um, so you know where there was lead getting into Canada that obviously not a good idea so they, they started testing for it. So if we want to look for safe limits um, we have to move away from the FDA and, and look at other jurisdictions uh, particularly the European Union and in Asia. So I looked at the European Union in general, um, the Czech Republic, because they actually had uh, limits for wild mushroom foraging, and China because they have such uh, uh, big uh, mycological um, um, or mushroom loving culture, mushroom loving, mushroom eating culture. So all of these are in uh, dry weight milligrams a kilogram. Some of them in the documentation are listed in wet weights and what we can do is basically a wet mushroom when you dry it is is about one tenth of the weight so if we multiply those wet weights by 10 we get an equivalent dry weight uh, amount um, so we're talking about three milligrams to five milligrams for most of these compounds and for tin it's a lot higher 200 and 250 uh, milligrams depending on whether you're looking at the European Union or China. Um, I had heard that the Czech Republic had an even higher amount for cadmium. Um, part of the problem was they, they had a big smelting industry as well and they were worried about um, people not actually being able to pick the mushrooms or legally be able to pick the mushrooms so they increased the limit to cover that. Um, and these values are taken from various um, documentation and where Fungi are listed, I've used the value for that. Um, for some of the compounds, fungi isn't listed specifically, and so I've taken the highest non-infant value. Uh, okay. So, um, a lot of different species, not just mushrooms, actually bioaccumulate metals. And what you see is, or what you, what you find is plants will bioaccumulate some, but they're not at a dangerous level um, by themselves. And so they might enrich uh, zinc for photosynthesis, for example. Um, the end result you know, isn't a toxic plant. There are a few exceptions and rice is one. So rice from certain areas of the world um, where I guess there's a lot of arsenic in the um, soil, um, it tends to enrich arsenic and you can have a fair amount in rice. And so for that reason, I think, uh, Indian basmati rice is generally um, um, a good thing and has low levels of arsenic, whereas I think some of the um, Thai 
Thailand rice um, has higher levels of arsenic. So um, generally eating plants, you're never gonna um, accumulate enough um, metals from those, those plants themselves. And there's a lot of heavy metals just in the soil in a sort of unenriched state. Um, at certain parts around the earth where people build mines, of course, this is where there's enriched amounts. And we can get new uh, deposits of heavy metals when there's a volcanic eruption. Um, all of this uh, magnet material has heavy metals mixed in with it and this will be then, and, and the ash that comes out will then cover the ground and, and um, deposit metals. Uh, mining foundries and smelters, there are all sorts of things where you can create a lot of dust or um, uh, microparticles in the air and uh, these uh, metals can then um, distribute around that area and, and be deposited. Um, likewise, coal burning power plants, you've got plants that have sort of bioaccumulated a little bit of material being turned into coal where it's concentrated and then you've burnt that coal and uh, the pollution has, has spread around. Um, another classic is mercury in seafood, and this is the typical food chain accumulation that you probably saw in uh, school at some point, where you know the plants pick up the mercury and small um, uh, uh, in insects or, or krill and such like, um, and then small fish eat those, the, the plants or the krill, uh, and then you know, bigger fish eat them until you get to swordfish and tuna and that's where you have higher concentrations of mercury such that uh, now there's often advice not to eat these things particularly if you're pregnant because of the amount of mercury that can be in them. Um, and although plants by themselves uh, don't um, uh, accumulate too much uh, material, if you take a bunch of plant material and refine it you can end up refining the parts that do contain uh, that, um, uh, that that bioaccumulated metal. Um, so you so some plant products uh, can contain higher amounts. And for this reason, the FDA tracks about 700 food types for contamination. Um, as I mentioned, they haven't actually released the amounts that they look for to determine if it's contaminated, but they do track a, a whole bunch of different food types. So, um, which metals are bioaccumulated in mushrooms? We know there's over 40 different metals can be found in mushrooms, but we're really only interested in a few known problem metals. And this is what we've done um, our initial experiments on. So arsenic, cadmium, chromium, lead, tin, and mercury. Uh, so these ones which are well-known uh, uh, issues and there's quite a lot of literature where people have uh, analyzed mushrooms for these. Okay, so um, do certain species of mushrooms uh, bioaccumulate metals? And uh, yes, some mushroom species are actually called hyperaccumulators, and this means that they can enrich uh, the metal hundreds to thousands of times above what you would find in the soil surface. Um, most of the mushrooms that bioaccumulate metals are mycorrhizal, and so in part of their trade with uh, plants and trees, they are dissolving um, these trace metals from um, the environment, from the soil, and then exchanging them for sugars with the trees or, or with the plants. Um, and sometimes that process is very efficient for certain metals and they, they accumulate more of those than others. Uh, a lot of common edible species have been tested uh, somewhere in the world. Uh, there's big interest in this. So you can see publications of all sorts of beliefs and uh, other common edible species and, and the results of them. Um, so we have an idea of some species that might accumulate more metals than others. Um, but we want to really determine, you know, is it a combination of the site where they're growing here? Um, and, you know, is the mushroom species, we're not really always sure that the mushroom species is the same as the one in um, in Asia or in Europe uh, because of the you know, as we're learning from DNA barcoding and sequencing that many of the species are actually unique to the US. 
So members of the beliefs and Amanitas are well known to bioaccumulate uh, meadows, there are mycorrhizae of course. And um, one particular species, uh, Amanita uh, strobiformis, uh, European Amanita, um, I think it may have been found here, I don't know, but anyway, mainly in Europe, and this hyperaccumulates silver, so this will accumulate uh, silver a thousand fold over what's in the local environment. Um, so that's quite amazing. So in our trial study, um, we it was just to see if it worked. Um, can we accurately measure metals in mushroom fruiting bodies? And uh, are there any bioaccumulating metals of concern? Are there any um, that we think we should watch out for? So. Uh, what we did is we collected two different species, uh, chanterelle and uh, bicolor belief, and we collected them from two different locations, Deer Lake Park and Hartwood Acres. And at the same time as collecting the mushroom, we also uh, took a sample of the soil. And in this case, we didn't really um, dig down a foot or something. We just took um, some soil from about an inch down. So this is still uh, fairly recent soil if you like um, and I need to read up on a few more studies to determine how deep we should really dig when we take our soil sample uh, but that's what we did in, in this initial experiment so uh, Lamont Urel was one of the people who uh, collected a chanterelle and I collected the other three um, so the bicolor beliefs and the other chanterelle from Hubbard Acres So when we collected the specimens, we took pictures and so on as per normal. Um, we took a soil sample from the top inch of the soil. And then we dried them for the mushrooms really as dry as could be. So um, cracker crisp as they say. And we dried them in a dehumidifier. And I dried the soil at the same time. And then um, we delivered the samples to Eurofin's Test America Pittsburgh branch and that's where they carried out the chemical analysis. For the mercury, they used cold vapor atomic absorption spectroscopy. So this is a method where um, the sample is uh, heated or shot with a laser, and as it's heated, everything sort of you know, burns, combusts, um, or if it's shot by a laser, it's uh, um, atomized, um, and then it's taken into the machine, and they can measure the amount of mercury in that paper and for the second method for the rest of the metals um, they used inductive coupled plasma mass spectrometry so this is another method where again you might um, heat and decompose the sample um, and then it um, is sucked into a, a plasma field and which it ionizes the metals and then it goes into a mass spectrometer where they measure the individual atoms or, or, or individual ions I should say um, so this will give you a series of peaks uh, where you can measure the um, amount of each of the different metals there. Um, and all of these instruments are going to be calibrated. They're typically used for analyzing soil samples in the fracking industry, um, but also uh, could be used for foods and other things. And there's a lot of regulation uh, around this industry. Um, so everything is you know, correctly calibrated and so on. And one of the important aspects with the mercury analysis is uh, you shouldn't um, uh, use the inductive plas a couple of plasma mass spectrometry for mercury. That seems to give unreliable results. So the cold vapor atomic absorption is the way to go, which is what we did. So uh, here's the first set of results. Um, the line across the bottom there. Uh, that's the uh, um, sort of guidelines of uh, thresholds and we basically got uh, mushroom followed by soil, mushroom, soil, mushroom, soil and on the left hand side is the chanterelles, on the right hand side the beliefs. So what we can see for arsenic is the soil contains a certain amount of arsenic. Uh, you wouldn't want to eat it, it does have higher than the recommended amounts. Um, but of course we're only interested in the mushrooms. So the mushrooms are all lower or even no detected arsenic for the um, chanterelles from Hartwood Acres. So that's pretty good. Uh, for the cadmium, um, this is the 
sort of one major outlier out of the metals we tested. And here again, uh, we can see chanterelles on the left. Both the chanterelles and the soil contain um, very low levels of cadmium, nothing to worry about. But the bicolor beliefs are picking up and bioaccumulating uh, cadmium over and above what's in the soil. And the specimen at Deer Lakes, the amount in the soil isn't really any more than what's in Hartwood Acres, but that particular specimen uh, accumulated uh, about five, four or five times more, uh, sorry, about 20 times, I think, more than what was in, in the soil. Um, and the one at Hartwood Acres accumulated about five times more than what was in the soil. So uh, this is worrying. Um, it's more worrying if you ate bicolor beliefs um, every you know every week in a larger amount um, then you would start accumulating cadmium um, with the number of specimens we've done here we can't really give it any statistical significance um, we need to do at least five specimens before we start um, uh, getting better results but uh, this tells us that you know this is something that we need to worry about and and to look at uh, for chromium um, in the mushrooms basically every other bar so we've got the chanterre on the left uh, bicolor bleach on the right um, very low levels in the mushrooms or, or not detected and in the soil higher levels so that's great uh, lead is pretty much the same we do find a little bit of lead in the bicolor belief from Deer Lakes. Uh, so, you know, that's also indicating that maybe that site is a little more uh, contaminated, although the soil sample from Deer Lakes um, is actually better than that from Hartwood Acres. And again, as I mentioned, we were taking the top layer of soil and we don't know, you know, the un underlying geography and what is underneath the hill where I picked it, for example. So the mushroom mycelium could be going quite a lot deeper and picking up uh, deposits of metals um, uh, well away from the surface. Uh, tin and mercury here. So uh, tin, uh, very low levels, um, basically not detectable in most of the mushrooms and very low levels in the soil. And the recommended um, limit is so high, nothing to worry about. So in the mercury we have an interesting result here all the mushrooms um, look to have bioaccumulated material over the soil um, about two or three times more um, than or more than that than the soil and and um, sorry about two times more than the one milligram a kilogram limit um, so we have some discussion about this whether it's real mercury contamination or not and what we need to do is take a stool brought mushroom and analyze that as well. Uh, because we think that the mercury here is actually background contamination um, in the lab. And when you're working with the soil, it's a lot denser. So if you start with a gram of soil, it's a small amount of material, it's quite dense. And when you work with a gram of mushroom, you have uh, quite a lot of physical material, gram of dried mushroom. Um, and we think that's uh, maybe affecting the results. And so if we do a store-bought mushroom and we see a similar amount of mercury in it, uh, then this will tell us that um, we've got a background contamination issue and we can probably say, you know, we can average out a whole bunch of results and when they're low like this, we we'll say, okay, this is the background level and we're looking for amounts significantly over that. Um, if the stalwart mushroom comes back with a lot lower value, um, you know, close to the soil sort of value, then we really do have uh, mercury contamination in the mushrooms and we just don't know. Um, but that's something uh, we hope to find out soon. So the uh, conclusion at the moment is the bicolor bleak is bioaccumulating cadmium from both sites. And the Deer Lake specimen was about four times the EU limit and the Hartwood Acres specimen was at the limit. And, um, and for these limits, what they're typically thinking is that you're eating an average amount of mushroom um, per week. So based on the Czech uh, foraging guidelines, 
they were saying if you ate 300 grams of wet mushroom material uh, every week then these were the limits that you should think about uh, a lot of people eat less than that um, so they even in um, Czech Republic they considered that an average portion size of mushrooms um, might be 200 grams per week um, so the the levels you know uh, are um, lower than they need to be maybe um, but if you do eat a lot of mushrooms um, a lot of beliefs then uh, it may be a problem and um, at the moment it seems to be species specific rather than site specific uh, but we won't really know until we collect a, more, a lot more samples um, all mushroom samples show bioaccumulation of mercury as I said um, they're at or above the Czech Republic limit and uh, way higher than the soil uh, limit so we're going to explore and see if it's a lab contamination issue or not and um, at the last board meeting at uh, Christmas um, we decided that um, or I put forward a proposal to extend uh, this study and collect more samples and the board okayed it so we have funds to uh, collect um, maybe 20 or 30 different samples uh, from different sites so we want to look at a number of different sites that may be contaminated um, or where people um, commonly collect the mushrooms um, and anywhere within western Pennsylvania um, and we also want to analyze commonly uh, common edible species um, so we could do some things like chicken of the woods that might be a good one which is not mycorrhizal um, but other things are like you know popular beliefs um, I know some of the Amanitas some people eat them maybe if we analyze them and see the amount of metal in them they would be a little less enthusiastic about some of the Amanitas um, so we can you can explore and see so we're looking for collection sites um, um, we'll be looking for people to collect samples very easy um, we can distribute test tubes uh, when I collected in the field uh, I just put a soil into a wax paper bag um, and the mushroom into another one kept them together and uh, dried them both and that was sufficient um, you didn't have to do anything fancy at all so no, no special tools needed and uh, over time we hope to accumulate um, five species uh, of or five samples of each species um, so that will start to give us some statistically relevant results as far as which species bioaccumulate uh, so I, uh, I really want to acknowledge uh, Debbie Lowe at Eurofins um, and the Pittsburgh branch there and she was instrumental in getting these samples run which were very kindly run for free for us as a, a test trial uh, project and um, I think uh, uh, you know going forward um, we'll, we'll continue to use them um, they give very you know, nice consistent results so um, yeah that's a, a good collaboration and um, there is a lot of publications on this so if you start looking for heavy metals mushrooms bioaccumulation and stuff like that you can find hundreds of publications uh, I looked at a number of these and used them for sort of methods and, and help designing the project but the uh, more useful uh, book that I purchased was this mineral composition and radioactivity of edible mushrooms it's an academic book it's not something that you really want for your bookshelf um, as it's an academic book with you know limited sales potential it's expensive it's going to be um, 100 plus uh, about 150 dollars for the book or 125 for the PDF so not something that you want to go out and buy um, but for this project I think it was very handy and just getting an idea of um, all different levels of known contamination in different species and I'll be referring to that book in the future so um, we've got a few minutes uh, 10 minutes or so uh, before we switch over to the zoom meeting and the, the rest of this so I'm gonna have a look at the um, YouTube and see if there's any questions there um, 
All right. So let's see. Yes, so um, Garrett Taylor mentions it'd be interesting to compare with uh, the same species from somewhere untouched like Cook Forest. Uh, definitely. So um, most of the forests around Pittsburgh um, have probably been clear cut at some point or other. And of course, we've just got, you know, that legacy of a huge amount of uh, metalworks in the area. So um, the chance of sort of uh, metal pollution and deposits in the region are quite high. So even soil samples, just comparing soil samples from here to somewhere like Cook Forest would be interesting. Um, it's not to say that Cook Forest will be completely clean. It, you know, it could be that pollution has also blown in there and deposited heavy metals. We just don't know. Um, there's a comment about uh, Paul Stamets and uh, his book uh, Mycelium Running. Yes, so I, th I think part of the micro remediation um, idea is really this uh, accumulation of metals. Uh, one interesting thing is that the best species of mushrooms tend to be mycorrhizal species and those are a little harder to um, install in a place that you want to bioremediate. It's not like you can just go and uh, put some wood chips down and some spawn and hope the mushroom's going to grow into the soil and remove the metals. Um, so you might need to plant trees um, along with um, or inoculated trees for example to to get the mushrooms to grow there. And the other thing is the mushrooms will bioaccumulate material um, but what happens to it after that? It's, it's, if it's concentrated in the fruiting body and the fruiting body dies and then just sits on the top of the surface, you're drawing out the metals and depositing them on the surface. Um, so then you end up with the issue where maybe you need to harvest all the mushrooms and take them away and put them somewhere else. So you're sort of moving the, the uh, dirty soil, if you like, from one place to another. And I, I think that's part of the reason why um, people will often just strip off the topsoil um, take it to some dump and bury it basically and, and then put new topsoil down take them from somewhere else. Not very green or efficient but that's the way people do it. Um, yeah Allegheny National Forest uh, is another place okay Garrett does mention that it's uh, logged and drilled so yep that's a good place. Ah we have um, someone from Mexico who did a master's thesis on heavy metals. So I have to say I am a scientist, but I am most definitely not a mycologist and this is not my speciality. And um, they mentioned that urban areas, uh, uh, places you want to work, uh, places they are working on. And they're welcome to get in touch with me. Yes, so um, when there was a lot of lead in gas, um, a lot of lead would have been deposited at the side of roads. So if you have freeways, motorways, uh, whatever, you might find high lead deposits at the side um, on the verges. So this may not be an area you want to pick your mushrooms from. I don't know when the US stopped putting lead in gas. Um, of course, the lead isn't just going to go away. So it will be in the soil for a long time. So yes, that could be a, an issue still. Um, Stephen Buckley mentions, uh, would you think multiple specimens from the same species in the same site could vary significantly in concentration? We don't know. We just haven't done enough at this point. Um, and that's part of the reason, yeah, we just need a sample more. Um, we should be able to tell from existing studies how much um, variation there is when people, you know, collect 50 specimens from one area. Um, you know, around a certain area and, and see the variability. Um, so, yeah, that, that will be uh, something we do. That's probably out of our funding range because, um, you know, once you're talking about 50 samples with 50 soil samples as well, it starts to get a, a little more expensive. Um, yes, yeah, so someone talks about um, 
lead where leaded fuels were used yes new york park should elevated lead in things like earthworms so definitely that's going to be an issue um there's a delay between the questions appearing and me answering so um yeah so there was a discussion they said morales took up lead but no report of our state okay so it's sort of the tail end of morale season right now um i haven't i've got some morales in the fridge i didn't pick up any soil when i was out um, but i'm going to go to the back to the same place this coming weekend um so even if i don't find any morales i can still take a soil sample um so yes it would be interesting to do that um and see you know if we're finding arsenic or if we're finding lead or other metals in morales and again, um, morales can like areas where, you know, it has a higher pH with lime around. And this might also mean that there's higher contamination in those areas. Um, I did see a question scroll by where someone asked about the Zoom meeting. Um, the Zoom meeting is open to club members and an email was sent out to all active members as of a couple of weeks ago with the login information. I'm afraid the Zoom meeting isn't open to the general public. Um, yeah, so it's it's an experiment, and uh, if we keep it open to members, um, we don't get Zoom bombed or anything like that. So it'll be the first time. All right. So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, shut down the YouTube stream, and I'm going to get the uh, Zoom meeting working. And, uh, and actually, I think one of the problems with the sound in the beginning was I had the Zoom meeting going in the background, and it may be that that's captured the microphone I was going to use, and hence this uh, streaming software couldn't do that. But anyway, thank you for listening and uh, tuning in for this talk. The stream will be archived here, and if we are not able to do um, any meetings in the future, uh, in the immediate future, then we will look at setting up a similar type uh, streaming event, uh, possibly from somebody else's house. And uh, yeah, try and keep a uh, club active and informed. Okay, uh, see you in Zoom.